In Mark 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whoso, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever will come after me. Well, there's a, that's a tall order. Coming after Jesus. Coming to Jesus, we see, is the first step, but it's not the only step. If you're a step kind of person, if you're always looking for something to do, come after Jesus. <laughs> Coming to Jesus is not the only basis for reasoning on whether or not a person enters into glory. You say, well, well, I know he's come to Jesus, but that's not the end of the matter. In the end, it, a lot of people came to Jesus that didn't enter into glory. Not everyone who's made a profession of faith will be saved on that day. God's in the business of trying faith. He's going to find out whether or not what you say is genuine or not, or, or what you say is actually... The, 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 well, not everyone, not everyone. As we examine the scriptures, we'll find that this is the doctrine of Jesus. This is, see, what Jesus is saying is just not words. We, we've been going through the words of Jesus. And G, what Jesus says is spirit and it is life. Jesus doesn't say anything that's coincidental. What Jesus says is profound. It's, it's, it's got to be reasoned on, and it's got to be followed, obeyed. Faith must be tested. Professions must stand the test of time. They have to. It's not just to say, well, well, I just, but I did, I can remember back in 1945, I raised my hand, and, and be based on that alone now, if there is such a thing as salvation, God's got to let me in. Is that right? Well, I, I'm not just making this stuff up. There's people that preach this. There's people that believe this, that just because you made a profession at one point in time, now God, if there is such a thing as God, he's going to have to honor that because I, I did, after all, get baptized. I did after I made a profession. I stood up before people, and I said, I believe that Jesus is God's son. Now, based on that alone, See, this is not what Jesus is saying here. Everyone that comes is, that's not necessarily mean you're going to be chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. God has chosen to work salvation in such a way that it requires 100% of everyone's attention that comes. Now, see, this is, this is a marvelous way that God's designed salvation. He's designed salvation in such a way that when you come, well, now there's some things to do after you come. It's not just that you came. I, I, I came to the cross, but don't know what to do. No, God's going to give you something to do. Salvation, it's, a, it's a, law, a lifelong process. It's not something that happened to you once upon a time. It's something that's happening in you right now. You're being saved from the wrath to come. Salvation. God's working salvation in you. It is a very real beginning coming to Jesus. And you have to come to Jesus before you can receive anything from him. You do have to come after him. But um, he's going to give you something to do when you come to him. After salvation has been initiated in the person, see, it, something does have to begin. You do have to begin, but once it is begun now, once that once it, salvation's been initiated and you are genuinely saved, I mean, you come to Jesus, you believe the record that God's given of his son, you've heard someone preach the gospel and you've responded in faith. That was a valid beginning. It's genuine. I've heard some people say, well, but in the end, if you don't get in, then you never really believed. Well, I don't know that you could substantiate that. There were some people that really did begin. They began good. It's just that they didn't have enough to continue until the end. It's required then, after you've come, after you've really been saved, for you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is part of it. This is, this is the part that, that I, I fear that not many 
are preaching in the day we're living in. They're saying, well, you come, and that's good. But that's the end of the matter. And that's actually where they drop the ball. They say, well, you know, we're out here trying to save other people. Now, you just go on. No, feed my sheep, right? Let's go on to perfection. God's made a place for himself in salvation. Every moment of every day. See, if this, if this is, if we're not growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord at all times, then it is greatly to be questioned whether or not we're going to be found acceptable on that day. See, we're, we're given a commission here. Come, follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow. God's made a place for him, himself. At any point in time that the one being saved withdraws from the process or withdraws from God, all the fine assistance shifts from fellowship to recovery. And there it is, there is a different, it is a different manner of the kingdom. See, there's, there's, you say, well, it's all the same. Well, now it's not all the same. If, you, if any man sin, we have an advocate, but you do have to be given to repent, right? So see, this, this, is, this distinction needs to be made. There's, you're going on to perfection, but see, that doesn't mean you have to sin. And, and I don't want to cloud this issue, but see, at any point in time, you withdraw from God. That's sin. He said, my soul shall have no pleasure in anyone that draws back. And, and all drawing back in the scripture is unto perdition. So see, there's it's a very real perilous situation we find ourselves in, those who have believed now. I'm talking to those who have believed. Because unless you're going forward, you are going backwards. There are two different things. Now, the, the manner of salvation is designed this way. This is the way that God's chosen the save men. Jesus has revealed it in our text today. Whosoever, this is to every, any, whosoever. Now, we have a salvation. We have a gospel that is to everyone. Whosoever will, let him come. If anyone needs a system to follow, this surely is a good one. It's four-point salvation. You want to see four points? Come to me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. This is a good one. This is a good step program for people. Amen. You want to come to Jesus? He's going to give you something to do. Deny yourself. Now, look at all these different, along the way, there are these different tests. Flesh can't keep up with this. It just can't. Now, some may say that, well, I've done all four of these steps. Now, I know what I'm in. Well, this is not, like I said, this is not a one-time thing. This is a continual thing. You're going to have to continually deny yourself. It's not like I denied myself one, one pleasure a long time ago. I remember. I wanted to do something really bad, but I said no to it. Well, that's good. But now how about the next day? This is a continual process. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Salvation's proactive. Or it's not really salvation at all. In other words, it's, it's active in your life at all times. Jesus lays the foundation for everyone that would come after him. See, it's not like it's different for you than it is different for me. There's different aspects of, of circumstances in your life, but it's always going to be the same thing. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Come after me. Well, you'll find, you'll find me, Jesus said, when you search with me with your whole heart. When, and when it's, when it's the most important thing, when Jesus is the most important thing to you, you'll find him. He's right there. He's not far from every one of us. But see, he's got to be sought out. He's got to be desired more than any other thing. Now, there's a sense, it's come after me. It's a general call to the whole world. There's a sense in which that's true. Isaiah spoke of this general call. Remember Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, one that is thirsty, come to the waters. Come and drink. God's made it available. Everyone who was born of Adam, everyone who's under the curse, the provision that Christ has appropriated is for you. It's for you. Come and drink. Salvation, its waters are deep. And it's very effective. If you have sin, go to Christ. He's, he has the remedy. Amen. Jesus said it like this, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Now, I know you've all tasted of this water. You've been weary and heavy laden. But you came to Christ. His provision was adequate. Everyone that's thirsty, 
Take my yoke upon me, you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Jesus has rest for the souls of humanity. He does. you got to come to him. you got to turn away from what you were following and come to Jesus. And if you do, he'll give you rest. That's a general call. But see, there's a higher calling. And Jesus is actually making this distinction along the way. Everyone that he's called, many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, few pass the test. Few, as, as you start walking with Jesus, he's going to start making demands of you. And some people just aren't willing to, to pay the price. That's just the bottom line. They walk with Jesus for a while, but they find that his demands are just too great. And so they... For whatever reason, they break off fellowship with him. Now, the call is sent out to everyone. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's commanded that every man, everywhere, to repent. Why? Because there's coming a time, there's coming a day of judgment when every man's going to have to give an account for the deeds done in the body. So see this, because everyone's going to have to give an account, well then the salvation, see, it's going to be proven that it was adequate. It was, it was able to save every single sinner. The very fact that they didn't respond is going to be their condemnation on that day. They didn't, they didn't kiss the sun. The point that we'll find in today's text is that not everyone who initially responds to the gospel will be found watching on that day. Okay, now... You see, th these are the requirements. They're not going to change. If you want to follow Christ, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross, and you've got to follow him. At no point in time while you're here in this body will those conditions ever change. In other words, there won't be coming time. Well, I've been, I've been denying myself an awfully long time now. I think I don't have a little space here to do what I want. No, this is never going to change. But see, actually... As you get closer to Christ, you see this is actually a protection. What you once got you, that's what got you into trouble to begin with, isn't it? Now, Jesus is, he, he's, he has a much better way. Actually, if a person can see it correctly, the call that some have answered to come and follow Christ will actually turn out to their condemnation. See, actually, actually the fact that they answered the call, that will be the point of condemnation. That they answered it, but they weren't able to fulfill their, their profession. Now, this is a hard message for some years, especially in our generation. They've created another God. That all you got to do is respond. That's all you have to do is just say, I, I, I acknowledge you, but that isn't the God of heaven. Now, this message may not fill up the pews of the nominal Christian church, but it will provoke many who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb to continue on their way. This is the message that, that, that the, the church hears. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. This is what the church wants to do. This is what the, the redeemed love to have it so. We see that Jesus, he wasn't timid, was he? He didn't hold back from telling the people the whole counsel of God here. The message of salvation, when it's preached, it'll confirm the true condition of every man's heart. This is what it'll actually bring out. When the gospel is presented, what rises to the surface? Whether or not you believe it or you don't. Amen. And this really is going to be the condemnation. You'll never find yourself in a condition that Jesus hasn't spoken on. You'll never find yourself in a place that Jesus can't help you. Now, I speak this to the church. I'm talking about a person who's pressing towards the mark. A person who's given their... You're never going to find yourself... Oh, what a... Now I'm without. Now see, this, this is not, gonna, that's not the case at all. Jesus isn't going to lose even one of his people. Amen. People who are pressing towards the mark and are carrying their cross are in a safety zone, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. This is, a, how do you know you're safe? How do you know you're going to be saved? I'm carrying my cross. I'm denying myself, and I'm following Jesus. See, there's a certain confidence that can only be had by those that are doing what Jesus says. Be sure. Let me see, we can be sure of this. Jesus is not afraid. <laughs> I speak as a man, but Jesus is not afraid to offend people. Jesus will say things to offend you. Jesus will turn to Peter and say, Tch. 
Get behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things of God. Now, how did that sound on that night, huh? You say, well, I, I'm so, I, didn't, I didn't mean to offend you, Peter, now. Uh, you just have to understand that I had to say this because it's written in the Scriptures. No, this, this is, Peter said, this will never happen, Lord. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because that was motivated by Satan. Jesus, Jesus was not afraid to offend Peter on that night. I, I, you consider this, mix this with the modern religion. This is like, this was, no one would think Jesus would say stuff like this. But why did Jesus say it? For many are called, but few are chosen. There's not, there, there's not, a lot of people can't receive these words. Peter could receive them, didn't he? Peter didn't say, well, I'm not following you anymore. Look what, you've offended me. No, he didn't. Jesus is a good shepherd. He'll, he will, Jesus will always speak words that are necessary to hear. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But who is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Lord? He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now Jesus has outlined the will of the Father which is in heaven. What is it? Come, follow me, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. You know, I know that some would say this isn't a very popular message. You're talking about crucif you're talking about crucifying your flesh now. This is not a pleasant thing. I, I thought that, that, that Jesus died so that we could have our best life now. I thought that he died so that we could experience this great pleasure. Well, we are going to experience great pleasure, but it's just not now. Now is your time for carrying a cross. Now is your time for fellowship and with Jesus in, in suffering. Believe me, you don't have to ask for suffering. You just pick up a cross and it'll start to suffer. Your flesh will not want to be crucified. It's a hard truth for some, but it doesn't have to be hard for those that are receiving the word of God. See, this, this, is, this is actually you find that your greatest joy, your greatest victories are found when your flesh is crucified. See, it's, it's, it'll scream and cry every once in a while, but you just keep it on the cross and what's happening. There's another part of you. That isn't the only part of you. There's a part of you that's been born again. There are some I found that are so concerned with the salvation of others that they end up being completely ignorant of their own condition. They're off trying to save somebody else and they don't even know that they themselves have drifted far away from God. On one occasion, a man asked Jesus, Luke 13, 23, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he, this is what he said to the man. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. So at the end of the day, make sure you're in. Make sure that you're denying yourself and that you're taking up your cross and that you're following Jesus. And if you are, well then, see this... Ministering to others, that, that's got to just be a natural flow out of fellowship with Christ. You'll be, able, you'll be an able minister then. You'll be able to be used by God. But to see, if you're out there chasing after sinners, so to speak, and you haven't even taken care of your own soul, you haven't even made sure that you're in the kingdom of God, how are you going to be a benefit to them? These people actually were duped into believing that they were going to be saved, but... A, on closer examination, they were actually workers of iniquity. In this text I just, just read, he said, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now that came as a surprise to them. They thought they were in. <clears throat> Remember there was some, he said, When didn't we visit you? That when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. There are some people who, who actually think they, they, they think they bought into a religion that all they have to do is just raise their hand. And they're in. And they believe that. Well, they may have looked really religious on the outside. They may have washed the outside of the cup. But see, 
Fellowship with God has a lot more than do, to do with it than with the outside of the cup. If you're walking, if you're denying yourself and taking up your cross and following after Jesus, if you're fellowshipping with God and the Spirit, the outside of the cup's going to be clean. It, it, this is not, it doesn't leave you to, to, to look like a sinner, and yet on the inside you're all, you're all right. No. This man asked Jesus, if only a few would be saved. And Jesus is telling him that the bottom line is to make sure that you're one of those who are saved. This, there's, there's, you can have confidence in this area. There's, there's tests. He said, examine yourself to see if you be in the kingdom. Now, obviously, if you examine yourself, you'll come up with, 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 with ways of knowing if I am in the kingdom. Jesus doesn't take people at face value, does he? He says, 1 Timothy 3.10, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, is what he says, and let, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Another place he told Timothy, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of another man's sin. Keep thyself pure. Now, Jesus didn't take people at face value. He... he, he um, he says, if you want to follow, come follow after me, deny yourself. Now, what if a man wants to say, I'm following you, Jesus, but I have a little problem with this denying myself thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm still following you. But Jesus, is Jesus going to accept that? He's just going to say, well, that's all right. I understand it's really hard in the flesh. No, that's it. the next thing I'm going to deal with. Take up your cross. Crucify that flesh. See this? Say, well, but, but I know that the man says he's a Christian. He's a real, he's a, but he's just got a problem with fornicating. Well, the man's not a Christian. See, he, Paul's telling him, don't make them a deacon. If they can't even rule over their own body, if they can't rule over their own house, don't make them a bishop. See, in other words, he's, there's a certain amount of judgment that has to happen in the, in, in the house of God. There's a certain amount of wisdom and understanding when you're accepting people as brethren. They will, will, will do, will, but I, I raise my hand. I take communion every Sunday. But I just got a hard time with this denying myself thing. Of course, they don't say it quite like that, but you, know, you see what I'm saying. We must be wise when it comes to fellowshipping with those who say they are of the household of faith, but yet they deny the assembly of the saints. Well, what about that? Can a person forsake the assembling of the, of the assembly and and everything's okay. You see, you just have to understand, I really am a good believer. I just don't like to be around God's people very much. Is that acceptable? Will Jesus accept that and say, well, you know, I understand. You know, I have a hard time being around some professed believers too, right? See, the thing is, is that there's signs. There's actually things that are, that are visible in people that believe. Jesus said, whosoever will come after me, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. You can't do that and not be visible. You can't deny yourself and there'll be no indication of it at all. So when a person says, but you have to understand, I'm a real good Christian. I just can't keep myself from sinning. Well, we got a problem with this. This is a problem. This has got to be said. This is a problem. Jesus tells them, Coming after me, that's the beginning, but we're not going to stop there. Let's deny. Deny yourself. Now, I'm going to tell you that this is impossible for the flesh to do. The flesh cannot deny itself. It can't do it. Yeah. Amen. Okay? Flesh and blood cannot accomplish this requirement of the gospel. And it's on purpose that it can't. Jesus has given us a command that cannot be accomplished unless we're born from above. Only those who have a new man can crucify the flesh. Amen. Otherwise, flesh isn't going to get up there by itself. Flesh isn't going to volunteer, and it's not going to stay up there. It's going to have to be made to stay up there. Amen. Now, there's really nothing to be alarmed about because salvation is designed to address this very situation. So, see, I don't buy into this thing that I just can't help myself. I just can't help you. See, I just can't help myself. Well, I, I agree that you can't help yourself, but that's because you're not born again. Okay? That's because you, 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 you've departed from the faith. 
Say, well, but no, you don't understand. I'm a really good believer. I just can't stop sinning. No, you're not a really good believer. It's got to be understood. You've departed. Because there was a time when you first came into the kingdom, you'd have done anything that Jesus said. Now, Jesus says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, if you got problems doing that, you're going to have to go back to the beginning. You want to follow Jesus? Is this really what... Being born again is not an end in and of itself. It's unto something. You're born again unto something. Being born again opens the door for God to be able to work in you and for you to be able to obey Christ. Now, if, if that's not the case, then, then born again, what, is it, what does it translate into? If, if when you're quickened or made alive... It doesn't affect your mortal body, then it's not real. Because I read in my Bible that if you've been quickened, it'll, it'll make your mortal body alive unto God. You'll be able to subdue this fleshly lust. And if you can't, the, I'm not saying that this is something that you go and you lord over other people and you say, I, I don't. No, it's just for us. It's for you to be able to examine yourself and say, am I crucifying the flesh? And if the answer is no, let's get back to this repentant thing. Let's get back to this believing. Because until this is done, I can, I can actually end up at the judgment and say, but Lord, Lord, you taught in my streets. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. See, there's a religion out there that will lead you to believe you're in when you're really out. Jesus will never lead a man to think like that. Jesus will get right in your face, so to speak, and say, Are you denying yourself? Are you taking up your cross? Are you following me? Because if you are, well then, see, you're one of mine. Being born again allows God to be able to work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. Now, if God is working in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure, is your response going to be, but I just can't stop sinning. I'm sorry, I just can't. I just sin all the time. I don't know why. Well, is, is it God working in you? Well, see, this is a problem. And it's a problem that Jesus addresses. Salvation addresses the saving of men. This is what, it, it's what salvation is. Men are being saved. They're being transformed into the image of Christ. But what if what you call salvation isn't transforming you into the image of Christ? Then it isn't God's salvation. Because this is what God's doing. God's making people like Jesus. And we know in him is no sin. Now salvation addresses this. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Now God's mandating this from heaven. That's one, that, that's one way to look at it. This is what God expects of me. All those who come to, Christ, to Jesus will be made new. They will be made new. All, th all old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay? But why? So you can deny yourself. All right? Now, this I know this is, this is foundational, and, but this has got to be understood in the day we're living in. You can't live for yourself. And live for Jesus too. He won't, you can't serve two masters, right? Either you'll, you'll hate the one and despise the other. God has sent his spirit into your hearts. Doing what? Crying, do what you want? No. Abba, Father. I want to do what God wants. And now, in other words, he's given you the ability to actually do what God said to do. God can now send grace to work things in you. Now, this is, this is the part. Is it? I don't know that a lot of professed believers have ever got to the place where grace can teach them anything. Because grace is a good teacher. Grace is a teacher, and it will teach you some things. What does it teach you? It te teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly and righteously in this present generation. Now, like I said, this is the foundation level. But if you never even get past this, how, how can you fellowship with God if grace hasn't taught you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts? Grace has some very important lessons 
to teach everyone who is enrolled in Christ's class. Grace doesn't teach flesh, by the way. Flesh can't be taught anything. See, flesh has been written off by God. It's been written off, and, and it's been written off by the believer. See, now when you understand that, that there's nothing good going to come from flesh and blood. I'm never going to get any advantage in the flesh at all. Amen. Well, now when you understand that, you start seeing areas of flesh. I'm going to cut that off. Yeah. I'm going to cut this off. I'm going to prune this off. This is not being crucified. Not the way it should be. I can see it now. I couldn't see it last week, but today I can see it clear. Well, now's the day that grace... What happened? Grace taught you. It taught you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present generation. See, we know that grace doesn't teach the natural man. Well, we know this by Revelation, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And grace doesn't teach any other way. Grace it, it uses all the instruments that God give it, and God give it the Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit was given to us that we might know the things that are freely ours in Christ Jesus. So grace is an effective teacher because it shows us heavenly things, right? Grace shows us the, the, the things that Christ has, and what, what do you do? You say, well, I want that more than I want this over here. Well, you're not going to get it any other way. You're not going to get the things of heaven and keep the things of earth. It's not going to work that way. Amen. You're going to have to cut off the things of the body, cut off the things of the flesh, and, but you're never going to do that unless you've got something greater. And grace, see, it's a great teacher. Grace is going to teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly. Like, cause look at what I'm getting ready. I'm going to be a crown of righteousness. He's getting ready to give me a crown of righteousness. What's that going to cost, by the way? Well, I fear that many haven't counted the cost. You're going to have to give up this life to inherit everlasting life. Well, grace teaches the new man. What does it teach the new man? It teaches him new things. Things that flesh can't, flesh can't apprehend them, but the new man can. The new man's actually got his mouth wide open, Amen. waiting for grace to teach. Come to the assembly. What are we? We've got our mouth wide open. We want to be, we want to be taught by God. So we come and we submit one to another in love. We, we get a little bit from Brother Mike, a little bit from Brother Ricky. What, what's that? We're being built up in our most holy faith. Grace is teaching. Grace is a good teacher. Amen. Salvation didn't come by itself. Grace had to bring it. Salvation didn't just show up one day. No, grace brought salvation, didn't it? Amen. He said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Now, there are many who have come to Jesus that have, they've never denied themselves anything. They don't even think that, they don't even think that it, it's, it's even necessary. Didn't Jesus cut everything away? Jesus sanctified us, didn't he? He sanctified us. Why is blood now? We don't have to do anything. We can't do anything to be saved. I hear that all the time. Anything you can do to be saved. Someone needs to tell Jesus. Because he says, if you're going to come after me, you got to deny yourself, you got to take up your cross, and you got to follow me. That's what Jesus says. God's now looking, speaking as a man, he's looking down, he's going to make some selections based on those who have come to Jesus, have denied themselves, taken up their cross, and followed Jesus. He's not, many are, are called, right? But few are chosen. Well, that sounds like, now I know from God's perspective, he's known, his all works are known from the beginning. He knows what he's doing. But from our, our, from our vantage point, we're making our calling and election sure. How are we doing it? By the things we choose to do and the things we choose not to do. Amen. The denial of the old man with his affections and lust is not an elective in the College of Grace. It's like, well, I think I'm not going to take that elective this time. You know, in college you can take certain electives, and just, you don't have to take them, but it's good if some, you need to take some of them. But putting away the flesh isn't an elective. It's an absolute requirement. It's got to be done. We might say it's a prerequisite for obtaining a crown of righteousness. Do, so actually, he's, he's weighing this. And everyone that's in Christ is weighing this all the time. 
is the thing that Satan's putting in front of me right now. Is it worth trading the crown of righteousness for? Is it? Well, see, if you take it on that level, you would say, no, it's absolutely not. But Satan's a little bit more sly than that, isn't he? Doesn't make it quite that clear. It just looks like maybe it's just eating meat that's been offered to an idol. Maybe it's just something, maybe it's something that you know you shouldn't do, but you want to do it anyway. No matter what it is. Maybe it's just something that's not of faith. It's got to be denied, right? It's got to be cut off. Whatever's not of faith is sin. What does that mean? It separates you from God. That's what it means. It, it breaks the, the fellowship. You've got a fellowship with God. You're walking in the Spirit. You're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. You're on your way to glory. See, this, everything's smooth sailing, so to speak. You're, you're making advancements in the kingdom, and, and you're, you're, there, there isn't anything that's going to stand in your way. And then this small little thing comes along. You would have never guessed that this would be the thing that would pull you off course. What happened? Well, you've been drawn away of your own lust and enticed. Now the Holy Spirit, he's going to, what's he going to do? He's going to convict you of that. He's going to do it every time. The Holy Spirit's not lax concerning these things. He's going to convict you. And what's, what, what, at that moment, what's going to have to happen is you're going to have to weigh that the crown of righteousness is worth more than whatever this is. No matter what, if it's your mother, the crown of righteousness has got to, it's got to be brighter in your, your mind and your desire to be with Christ. It's got to be more than whatever comes up in your way. Well, Jesus is talking to those who've abandoned their own lives. See, the, when he moves past the coming unto me, and you're getting to the carrying of the cross, he's talking to people who are already, they've already given up everything. See, they've already denied themselves now. They're carrying this cross. Now, what, what kind of incentive do you have, Jesus, to give to somebody who's going to carry a cross? I mean, this is, this is not an easy task here. Going to carry a cross. They, now, I know a lot of religions out there. I hear them on the radio all the time, and they're not offering people a cross, believe me. They're offering people wealth or health. Or, or, or a really nice position, or, or a really uh, peaceful family. Maybe that's it. But very rarely do I hear any of these people talk about carrying a cross. And yet, Jesus talks about it. These people have already turned aside from what their own flesh wants. They, they, they know now. See, they've got it in their sights. I carry this cross. But see, the roots of the effects of flesh, they go much deeper than nominal religion can, can affect. See, the roots of the flesh, they go really, really deep. And as long as you got this body, you're going to have to fight with these effects of the old man that's, that's like lingering inside of you. Well, what's, what's, what's going to, how are you going to temper all these old, old effects that are in you, these old desires? He gives you a cross. <laughs> I think, I don't know if I've seen it quite like this before, but a cross is such a blessing to, to the new man. It gives him a, a place to do away with these affections and these lusts. You put them on the cross. See, now, now this, is effective, this is effective salvation. You crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts, and what happens? You're, you're able now to grow and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. But only to the degree that these old affections are nailed to that cross. To that same degree, you'll grow in Christ Jesus. Amen. See, the Spirit will abound, but only to the degree that you've crucified yourself. Oh, this is, this is, see, this is where the hope of salvation starts burning brighter than the love of the world. You've crucified. The, the, the affections and lust are there now. And you start, the hope of what's coming starts get burning brighter. And now it, actually this thing of torment 
This cross that's normally associated with torment and pain becomes a blessing. Amen. You say, I'm separated from this now. I can see I'm dead to the world. And now look, I'm, I can't wait. I just can't hardly wait for Jesus to come Amen. and take, take see, this is, oh, this is how God's getting you ready. He's getting you ready for eternity. And the cross is the means through which you fellowship with the death of Christ in order that you might be fellowshipping with the resurrection of Christ. This cross that many have sidestepped in the modern religion has sidestepped the cross and they've sidestepped the blessing of the cross. They don't see the effects. This effect's got to happen in you. you got to die to yourself. And he gives you a cross. Let him take up his cross. This is not something that is enforced. Uh, it will be someday. S someday every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. But right now, it's a, on a voluntary basis. You want to you wanna deny yourself and take up your cross? It, it's, like, it's like it's right there before you. you. Will you do that? Will you, will you do it? Well, you will if you see Jesus for who he is. You'll do it. Let him. It's almost like, it's almost like a mandate. It's almost like let him do it. You, 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 want, you want to know Christ? Nothing can stand in your way. Take up your cross and follow after Jesus. Paul proclaims the validity of, the, validity of this truth in Romans 6, 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We've been, we've been born out of death. Death on a cross, a cruel cross at that. We've been made alive or quickened in our mortal bodies in order that we may have the power or, or the will to keep that flesh on the cross. Well... We've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Why? Why? Why would we need all those things now? So that we can continue. I mean, we're li Jesus had asked us to do something that's so intense, you're going to have to have power from on high in order to do it. You're going to keep the old man on the cross? You're going to sustain that? Well, you're going to have to have all things that pertain to life and godliness now. But he's, he's provided it. He's given you all things that you need. God's given us the means. I, I, I like this thought. He's given us the means in salvation to, as it were, keep up with Christ. I, that's a big task. But he says, follow me. Now, we know by example of the scriptures that Jesus is on the move. Jesus doesn't stay in one place for very long. So unless you're keeping up with him, you're going to lose Jesus pretty quick. But see, he says, take up your cross. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, salvation is designed to make us up to this challenge. Following Jesus. Nobody gets anything from Jesus at a distance. You've got to be close to him. I think all of us, all of us here would, would, would testify that that's true. You've made the most progress when you're with Jesus. Oh, yeah. Amen. But how are you going to do that? Well, take up, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And what's going to happen? He's going to give you. He's going to give you the ability to be able to keep up with him. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then he goes on. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same will shall save it. But what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his old soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. There is a coming a day that every single person that carried a cross and was following Jesus is going to be so glad he did. You've identified yourself with Christ. You've been fellowshipping with him in the power of his resurrection. The very fact that you've been carrying the cross proves it. I've been denying flesh. Well, you haven't been doing that on your own. God's been working in you. God sent Jesus into the world to do what? To save sinners. Well, technically came in the world to take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And see now, when he did that, he opened up a way that everyone who will.
can partake of this gospel. Any gospel that allows sin to express itself unchecked can't be from God. It just can't. Okay, and I know this is run rampant in our world today, but this is not... This is not what salvation's for. It's to, to make us clean so we can fellowship with God. Well, I'll leave you now with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, which is actually the environment wherein this is going to work, be with you all. Amen.